Hello and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and I'll be your host tonight for another hour of answering your gardening questions. You can get in touch with us by dialing 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Toll free number is 800-676-5446. We also accept your emails and your JPEG pictures and that address is byf at unl.edu. We do try to answer those emails on future shows and you've got to give us as much information as you can, including where you live. We need that piece. Backyard Farmer can also be found in a number of social media networks during the week, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So, Wayne, you have the plant of the week. That's right. So, <laughs> this week, entomology is going for their own plant of the week. Um, now, I start off with the rustic look of a and simple look of a vase <laughs> canning jar. Um, so what I last time I was on, we talked about galls a little bit and how there's a lot of different galls out there. So I took it upon myself to bring a bunch out. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on which one is which, other than what plant it's on. So this is all from wild stock. Uh, this is on wild grape. You can see this one's got a different shape. And then if they can keep up with me, here's one on the tip of uh, stiff goldenrod. Then our similar one on another type of goldenrod on the top. This one's extra special because it's got another one here. This is one of the more famous uh, goldenrod galls that's got the moth. And if I can dig it out, it's somewhere in here. We'll just move on to the Maximilian sunflower. Here's another one there. And then we got another one there on a different type. Don't want to forget my honeysuckle. There we go, different type of gall there. And there's the other goldenrod one that I was looking for. This one's a lot larger than that slender one. And then to the oaks. The oaks give us a lot of galls and a lot of variation. So if they can pan down, there we go. Some nice fuzzy hairy galls. For those of you, I might almost say tribble. Up here, we've got our nice fuzzy pink one on that stem. And then we've got some bud galls right here, causing all of that to go on. And then the fun part on the back of the leaf of these, there's even another one. These small ones, they start out white. I've had some phone calls on these this year, they're around. But the thing to remember about the galls is usually they're not a huge problem. Um, they may not even be here next year. So just let them go and enjoy the show. <laughs> enjoy the show like nature's wondrous pageantry. Right. I didn't want to copy Fred. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, Bill, you have a teensy weensy little piece of turf. Yeah, I have two samples here, and this is, these are samples from uh, Kentucky Bluegrass Lawns. If you have a bluegrass lawn, uh, you may be seeing two of these issues right now. So we'll start with, the, uh, start with the big one here. So if you notice the color, bluegrass is usually a little bit of a different, darker color. Right now, we're seeing a lot of iron chlorosis, especially in our high pH soils. It starts off generally in the west and moves its way east. This is a nutritional uh, issue that we see. Um, generally, I see it worse where we have a lot of irrigation in our heavy high pH soils. And this is a root issue. So the roots can't make um, certain compounds to help take up the iron. And so it gets really yellow like this. If you put fertilizer on, it will actually get worse because it will grow and there's not enough iron to make the green color and so it actually get worse that way. So if you have a bluegrass lawn and it looks yellow like this, um, you know, don't fertilize, try to back the water off and dry the soil up a little bit. And then you can try a foliar liquid iron product and you spray it onto the, the leaves and let it sit there because it's not gonna do anything good if it gets to the soil. We want it to stick to the leaves and then go into the plant and that will help the, uh, the grass uh, recover from the iron deficiency. And this is just a little sample I have here from my bluegrass lawn. If you look really carefully at it, um, you'll see some little uh, rust-colored spots on that. That's, this is rust, and this is the time of year where we have to see rust um, become more and more common. It blows in from the south. Um, and so if you have this on a lawn, it's really superficial. It might make your shoes a little bit rusty. Generally not going to kill the lawn. Um, when we get a frost in September or so, uh, it will go away. I don't recommend treating for it, but if you see this kind of coloration on your bluegrass, this is probably uh, rust. So two issues we're seeing in our bluegrass lawns right now. Perfect, kind of the color of Wayne's hair. 
Rust. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kyle, what do you have on a spruce of some sort? Yeah, this hey. was a blue spruce from my backyard. Um, the uh, newer, newer needles are still that nice blue-green color that, re they, that you're used to, but if you go back to the older growth, they are just dying and really not looking as good. It's a, a pretty typical symptom of a needle cast disease. And if you look closely, I'm not sure if we can zoom in on these needles at all, but you will start to see some black specks just right along those needles, those older needles. And that's actually the, the fruiting bodies of the fungi that are growing out of the stomata. Um, if, you do, if you are seeing this in your, uh, in your trees, you may want to uh, control them, uh, but you can't really do anything to control this time of year. So the time to control these needle cast diseases is early in the, um, in the spring when the needles are first starting to emerge. You'll want to do an application when they're about half, uh, half, halfway emerged, and then another application two to three weeks later. Perfect, Kyle, and that was pretty gar darn good camera work, I think. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sarah, a piece of beauty for your sample. That's right, something fun to look at. You know, a lot of gardeners also like to notice things <coughs> that are blooming uh, along the roadsides and in, on our wilder parts of our landscapes. This is one that's blooming right now. This is western ironweed. and. Um, you might look at these little buds and, and think they're brown, but these are all just getting ready to open. This plant was just going to pop into full color probably next week, and it's a great plant for pollinators. When I picked these samples, they had lots of butterflies and moths uh, and, and lots of other little critters on them as well. So western ironweed, this will get to be about, oh, close to three feet tall and um, uh, always in this kind of dark purple color. Uh, lots of little flowers, r r reminds me a little bit of an aster almost, uh, only the plant shape is a little bit different. It grows well in our clay soils, it'll do well in full sun in hot locations along a roadside where the soil is not always wonderful. So um, this would be a great one if you want to you know, create a, a prairie type planting in a landscape or a cottage type garden or if you want a plant that would be great for pollinators and butterflies. Perfect, and that is a really beautiful color of purple. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right, you get something not so beautiful, Wayne. <laughs> your first one, and I don't know that we've ever had this insect on. Uh, this is a viewer who is growing tomatillos, mm -hmm. and this is what's going on with them. And she wants to know what, anything she can do now, or if she grows them again next year, what should she do? Well, it's hard to say what will happen next year with these uh, if you plant them again. There are two different things that'll get <coughs> into tomatillos. Uh, as I was looking around. One is the tobacco budworm. Uh, usually it's a major cotton pest and a corn pest down south, but it does blow up and we do have it here in the state during the summer months. Uh, the other one is corn, good old corn earworm that can mm -hmm. get into corn, cotton, your petunias, all kinds of fun places. Uh, so uh, at this point with the damaged fruit, I think you might be uh, done for this year, but I would uh, not treat this year, but go and wait till next year. All at right. this point. All right, thank you, Wayne. All right, Bill, uh, grass okay. seaweed in <laughs> Kentucky bluegrass. Okay. Um, this particular viewer is thinking, I, he thinks it's fescue, he's tried pulling, pulls out roots, and he has done some things with some chemicals and he's still fighting it. Yep. Uh, he doesn't want to use Roundup and leave big old dead spots in his yard. Well, <coughs> that is a grass or a weed out of place, apparently. This is, that is tall fescue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's tough to give it a 100% diagnosis just from one picture, but we're like 99% confident that's what that is. Um, you know, the, the, the email also talked about uh, spraying certainty, and that is a product that you could use to control tall fescue in bluegrass if it's an old product. Uh, they've changed the label, and so you no longer can apply that product onto bluegrass for tall fescue control because it can be hard on the bluegrass <coughs> and people misidentify their lawns and they kill their tall fescue lawns. So the old labels are still legal, but the new <laughs> labels uh, don't have it on there. So you're really limited to Roundup, but you have bluegrass, and when it cools off, the bluegrass is going to like to uh, to fill in those holes quickly in this fall. So put some fertilizer down, a little bit of Roundup to kill that tall fescue, and um, you know, a couple weeks later, you won't be able to notice it. All right, thank you, Bill. All right, Kyle, you have a couple of corn things here. This is North Omaha, and the other one's uh, Lincoln, but saw this weird growth coming out of the corn ears and wants to know what it is. Oh, it's one of my favorite fungi. That would be a corn smut. 
Um, <laughs> and so it's uh, actually it's a delicacy in Mexico, uh, huida coche. And so if you're feeling adventurous, you can go ahead and fry it up with some uh, some jalapenos and garlic, and have a nice a uh, nice treat. But um, otherwise, if it isn't your corn and you don't want it, uh, I would recommend removing the infected ears, and that will prevent it from spreading any further. Um, also, if you, anything you can do to limit um, to any, 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 any sort of injury, such as insect feeding or something like that, is that will help the fungus infect as well. All right, and you have a second picture that maybe fung, maybe smut starting in the middle. That would that would be my guess. Yeah, yeah that it's just the yep yeah, the early stages of of the corn smut. Okay, so they need to get the jalapenos and the garlic ready. Indeed. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, Sarah, you have a tomato that is being kind of interesting and we have had this in previous years but not this year. What's going on here? You bet. Yeah, it's kind of an unusual situation where the seeds in the tomato start to germinate inside the tomato so you get these little sprouts growing. Um, it's, not, it's not totally uncommon. I mean we do see it a little bit from year to year. Sometimes if there's low potassium on the plants we see it a little bit more. There can be some cultivar differences too where some, uh, some cultivars may tend to do this a little more often than others. But it's really just kind of an oddity. You can still eat those tomatoes. So if you just kind of uh, hollowed them out, took the gel and the seed part out, you could still eat the flesh. It doesn't make the tomato inedible. Uh, it's actually, it actually has a name for this. It's called vivipary if you want to look it up. So just a little oddity in tomatoes. And really does look like worms, I must say. It does, but it's actually sprouts, <laughs> not worms. How, how it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, last season we featured the benefits of milkweed, and we talked about what a great plant it was for several species of insects, especially those monarch butterflies. For our first feature tonight, Tom Weisling talks about how to collect milkweed seeds to plant for next season. In the past, we've talked about having milkweed in your garden. Milkweed is a great addition because it adds diversity. So you add that with flowers, you have patches of this milkweed, you're creating a great environment for many insects, including monarchs. Some of these insects may actually be beneficial. So we talked a little bit about, you know, leaving them in the garden if they just happen to sprout up. You can thin them as you need to, or you can just let them go, and they will spread on their own. But if you want to propagate, there's some things you could start doing now. First thing is to identify where do you have milkweed? What's the species that you want to try to grow? Now remember, you don't really want to try to plant showy milkweed in a place like we are out east because it's just not the right conditions. So you want to go with plants, the species that are local, grow well in the region. So you want to collect seeds. That will be your first step. You got to wait for the seeds to really get brown and harden within the pod. If the pod is green like this one is, really the seeds aren't ready. So you want to leave it on the plant for quite a while. When it's ready, you're going to give it a squeeze. If it pops open easily, then it's ready. Then you're going to collect the pods that you want from the particular species, move them off to an area where they can be dried. Now sometimes when you go to pick these uh, pods, you may find these little bugs. We've got to put entomology into this somehow, but there's little red bugs walking along on these pods, and they're actually feeding on the seeds. They're not going to hurt anything. They're not going to diminish the yield. They're just nice little seed bugs that like milkweed seeds. So you've collected the seeds. You've opened them up. You end up with a bunch of fluff. But there's all kinds of seeds in here. You want to try to separate the seeds from the fluff. Sometimes you can just put it in a bag and just shake the bejeebers out of it and that will loosen it up. Sometimes you have to go and hand pick it. But take the seeds and then in the winter time you need to cold stratify them. So put them in between some paper towels, moist paper towels, put them in the refrigerator for 30 days and then you're ready to start planting. If you want to do it inside, put them in jiffy pots, a little bit of soil. Water the soil first and then place your seeds, usually two per pot, and wait for them to germinate. If you want to plant them outside, take them outside, plant them anytime after the, the frost. You could transplant the, the seedlings that you have, or you can put seeds directly in the ground. Just make sure they stay moist and try to plant clumps of milkweed, lone milkweeds around. The monarchs will run out of food pretty quickly if you're trying to feed the monarchs. So they may look nice as single plants, but try to get a little clump going and make sure you plant plenty of flowers for the other insects to feed on. 
Milkweed is one of our favorite plants out in our garden and it's really obviously a great selection for attracting all those pollinators and the butterflies. And, and here we go with our next round of picture questions so we can answer those viewer questions. So uh, we have a viewer here, Wayne, with petunias. She thinks, she, uh, she thinks she's seeing tiny, tiny little insects on them, but they don't move. So what is she really seeing? Well, in the insect world, we call that frass. Uh -huh. That would be the remnants of probably that either, could either be the tobacco budworm that I mentioned earlier, or the corn earworm again, or it could be some of our other cutworms that'll get into your petunias as well. One nipped off one of mine, and it still has not decided to flower since then. Um, usually, sometimes the BTs will work depending on which one it is, not always. If you're looking mm -hmm. for that kind of control, if it's not really showing up and doing a lot of damage, it might already be gone. It's hard to say at this point. All right, and they do turn the color of the flower, which makes it, of course, yes. most interesting to find them. <laughs> yes, which is one of the reasons why we say don't identify insects by color. <laughs> well, there you go. Oh, it's a purple worm. No, no, no. Now it's pink. <laughs> 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 All right. So, uh, picture two is a Woodcliff viewer up by Fremont. Um, had a low area that was filled with sod. Sod filled in is an awful lot darker a broader foliage, what do they do? Kill the dark one, kill the light one, reseed, or just see what happens, Bill? Well, this is a great example of the uh, iron chlorosis that I talked about to start the show off. And the sod looks like it's tall fescue, and that doesn't have the iron issues in this time of year as the, uh, the Kentucky bluegrass. So that's one reason it's so severe right now. Um, likely, once the chlorosis ends, when the soils cool off in September, the bluegrass will have a nice darker color and it might help but you're probably still going to be able to see the, the difference in color because you look you have an older bluegrass variety with a new dark tall fescue variety so your options would be you know do you get rid of the bluegrass or do you get rid of the tall fescue um, it's really up to you personal preference uh, what you're most comfortable with um, the tall fescues benefit you don't see that iron chlorosis and so this would be a time of year, especially with this weather, that you would round it up or till it up or solarize it or whatever you want to do to kill it and then, and then reseed with what you'd like to, to have. But I don't think you're going to lose that um, color distinction with those two grasses. I don't think so either. I've seen a couple spots in Lincoln that are a couple, three years old. And it's That's the problem with solid. You know, yeah. it's always different cultivars and different colors. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Bill. All right. Tomato question for you, Kyle. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is a mortgage lifter tomato, which is, of course, an heirloom. And um, she's, she's wondering why it just looks dreadful. She's in Fremont. She did everything right for both the mortgage lifter and a newer variety called chocolate cherry. And the chocolate cherry doesn't look anything like the mortgage lifter. Uh, that looks like a fungal disease, um, early blight, caused by an alternaria fungus. Um, and the mortgage lifter uh, varieties are a, bit, a little bit more susceptible than, um, than some of the other varieties to, or to this fungal disease. As far as control, um, if you are really, uh, really worried about it, you can use some fungicides. However, sanitation works pretty well, so just remove the infected leaves. Uh, and uh, remove the infected leaves and avoid overhead watering as well. Overhead watering will splash the spores up onto the, up onto the other leaves and can help spread the disease. And just know that those heirlooms are pretty susceptible to all of those diseases and the new varieties aren't. Indeed. That's the way it goes, sacrifice flavor for no spots on your leaves. Yes. <laughs> all right, Sarah, um, this is a viewer in the Lust Hills, Hornick, Iowa, so Woodbury County. Um, she, she says her black diamond watermelons didn't fare so well. Mm -hmm. uh, those are black, like, I don't know what those are, but um, she did do what sounds like things right, dug the holes, mixed it, mixed a potting soil mixture and sand, kind of. Uh, she actually purchased plants and then put them in as opposed to seeding. So she wants to know, know what to do next year to get these watermelons to grow. Right. I, I don't know that I would have added potting soil to your um, soil mix. You know, <clears throat> watermelons prefer more of a sandy lust type soil, but they will grow in clay. So um, I, I, I just don't know that the potting soil really helps you much. The other thing I'm wondering is how the plants did. I mean, if the plants grew really, really well, 
and um, your watermelons were just this small. I'm wondering if maybe you just harvested them too soon. You know, some of the, the like the black diamond type watermelons, they take a long time before the melons actually get big enough and, and are ready to be harvested. So sometimes we don't really even see them coming into harvest until, oh, you know, into end of August or even into September. So you may have just harvested the melons a little too soon before they were actually ready to go. Um, and so that's probably the best I can say, Kim, without more information and not knowing how the plants themselves did, that, that, that's probably what I would say. Okay, and maybe start from seeds next year. Sure, sure. Watermelons grow really well from seed. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Sarah. You know, each week we take a minute to see how things are growing out at our garden. Here's Nebraska Extension educator Terry James to tell us what's happening in the backyard farmer garden. This week at the Backyard Farmer Garden, again, looking at all, all America's selection winners for 2017. This one, we're actually gonna look at another flower, but this is a perennial flower. This is a Penstemon Twizzle Purple. It's a perennial here, zones five to eight. So probably out west and up northern Nebraska may not be able to survive the winter here. We'll have to see how well it does here in the southern part of the state. It is about 18 inches tall. It's done very well till the very heat of the August. We lost a lot of flowers. We have cut it back. We'll see if it does rebloom. It is a very pretty purple. Uh, it will bloom the first year from seed. Uh, one inch tubular flowers long, had quite a few pollinators on it. Um, will grow up to about 35 inches high. However, ours have only made it to about 18 to 24. So haven't made it to its full potential. Not for sure if that's just because it's the first year in the ground. So we're gonna keep an eye on it. Hopefully we'll make it through the winter here. So check out Twizzle Purple Penstemon in our backyard farmer garden. As Terry said, our Penstemons kind of got fried by that heat wave. We're hoping they'll make a comeback. And a big thank you to Terry and of course all those master gardeners who do a great job of keeping those gardens looking fabulous week to week. Visit because they are awesome. All righty, picture three is yours, Wayne. Sunflowers, critters on sunflowers, big greenish ones fly and make a buzzing sound. They do not like their picture taken, apparently. <laughs> um, they're in Cambridge, Nebraska. Uh, they haven't found the second spot of them, but, and then there's black ants on them too. So what, what, do, we, what do we have We've got here? two different beetles. The second picture shows the second beetle, type of beetle, really well. This is a tumble flower beetle. And that wound on the sunflower is pretty typical. They like to f feed on plant exudates. So anytime you've got a leaky plant, they're gonna be around uh, utilizing that sap. The other ones are green June beetles. Mm -hmm. um, since Cambridge is down towards that southern run of Nebraska in the central part, that's where we're seeing green June beetles start to make their appearance. Um, in some areas, um, it, they're quite nasty as far as how bad they are. Um, at this point, if you want, I would recommend smashing those green June beetles as soon as you can, uh, just to slow down the population increase in your area. All right, sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> Two bricks, brick Two A, bricks. insect, brick B. Bang. <laughs> All right, Bill, this is an Omaha viewer. Um, wants to identify what's causing his lawn to die, fungus, spider mites, something else. Um, he said he did some samples of the soil and then put something on this spot, but he didn't tell us really what he put on this spot. Yeah, I'm not really sure. That could be a lot of things this time of year, unfortunately. And I'm sorry, that's a really bad answer, but it, it, it could be a lot of things. Um, we're, we're leaning more towards insect because it's just so widespread, but for such a small area and it's just complete devastation. And we wouldn't see that from a lot of diseases. Uh, the question that I'd have is, um, is it getting worse or not? If it's getting worse, it's probably gonna be insect or something else because the weather's been not pretty conducive for growing healthy grass and not a lot of disease aside from a little bit of that rust I showed before. So um, if you're really unsure, you send a sample in mm -hmm. and uh, take a look and, and see. And if you do send a sample in, send it from the margin of where the grass is dying. So that's what we would try to find if it's a bug or a disease or some other type of a problem. So he's your guy. 
Yeah, it's <laughs> uh, it's next to impossible to, to figure out what's going on if you send in a completely dead sample. So really try to go for the margins. And it's a great time to see your sod. So if you, it's dead, okay, let's fix it. So it's, this is the time to do it. And that's to the diagnostic clinic, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. And yeah, they could also roll that back along the edge that you're talking about as they're taking that sample. And if they find a lot of grubs in that area, that would be where they would find them is on that leading edge. Mm -hmm. So if they're taking your sample to send in and they peel that back, they can check for the grubs while they're there. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Great. All right, guys. Kyle, you have uh, two separate shroom pictures. Uh, one is from Hershey, and um, what kind of wants to know what it is? Says they get very large, and the second one is Gibbon, and they get very large. In fact, I think the second picture here, if there is one, is like there's a hat in the picture or a foot or something, and they're just humongous. Wonders if they're from horse manure, uh, and. They're, they're just both kind of wondering what they are as opposed to what to do about them. Yeah. Um, well, they, they kind of look like parasol mushrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, parasol mushrooms can get very large like that. Um, they can also form, they can be solitary or parasol mu mushrooms can also form fairy rings, kind of like we had in that, that second picture where there was that half circle. And it's not uncommon for inside of a fairy ring for, their, for the grass to have a slightly different growth habit than the grass on the outside of it. Um, one thing, when, when, if you ever are sending in pictures of mushrooms, it's a lot more beneficial if we get pictures of the entire mushroom, so the stem and the underside of the cap as well, so we can see the gills, and that really gives a lot of information about what type of mushroom it is. Um, as far as what they're feeding on, really it's just going to be on de uh, feeding on decaying plant material um, underneath the soil. All right, excellent, Kyle, and uh, those are fun mushrooms. Yes, they, they are. Uh, go like that. <laughs> We also like to get pictures from not here, which is Gibbon and Hershey. <laughs> All right, uh, Sarah, this is a viewer in Omaha. They have a, a, a tree that has kind of all of a sudden one little piece turning red. Um, they, they wonder why this has happened. Is there anything in specific? And, and we don't have a picture from our, um, our maple people, but we're hearing a lot of, okay, our maples are going completely red, especially that autumn blaze one. So mm -hmm. difference between one dead branch and one red tree? So early fall coloration like this where, you know, the, lead, the, the leaves are turning the color we would typically see in the fall is a, a very common stress symptom. So it tells us that there's something basic going wrong with the plant. Now in this particular picture, it looks like this branch is dying. And I can't say exactly why it's dying, there may be some bark damage or, you know, maybe a bore issue or maybe there's some um, long-term drought damage that's causing this tree to, to kind of decline in vigor that could cause a branch like that to die. But the, the red needles are, or the red leaves are just a, a sign of stress, basically. And so when we see that symptom in other trees, like say in, in maples where we see um, red fall color this time of year, that, again, it's telling us that something basic is going wrong with that plant. Maybe there's been some root damage in the past, or maybe it's just really drought stressed, or maybe it's got some girdling roots. So you need to look for all of those basic things that could be um, causing the tree to decline in health. And then, of course, address them, you know, whether it's watering, whether it's adding mulch, whether it's preventing trunk damage, you know, you name it. All right. Thank you, Sarah. You ready, Sarah? I'm ready. Let's go. What would cause cherries to be good tasting for a week and then turn sour? Pass. <laughs> <laughs> Are aspens a good tree to plant in a west-facing dry soil situation? Uh, no. They would tend to get leaf scorched. That would not be a great site. All right. Does paint on raised beds affect the safety of the food that you're growing in those beds? It could. If it's an older paint like, and has lead in it, yes, potentially. All right, when should clematis be pruned? Depends on the clematis, so you really need to know which type you have, and there's three different types. And would now be good for any of them? Um, no, not really. We would either do that in the fall or in the spring, pr primarily, unless there were dead branches. You could take dead branches at any time. All right, uh, an Omaha viewer wants to know about pruning a service berry now that's gotten a little bit out of kilter. It'd really be better if you could wait until fall, um, if at the earliest. Really, next March would be ideal. All right. How do you remove a stump? Grind it out. <laughs> Perfect. That's pretty much the only way. <laughs> Perfect. None of those 
chemicals in a bottle do it, do no, they? No, they won't do it. <laughs> All right. You ready, Kyle? I uh, doesn't mat really matter, does it? <laughs> <laughs> That's really the best answer of anybody. <laughs> okay, we have a viewer who says his cucumber leaves are turning sort of whitish. They look like they have a mold on the surface. Uh, could be powdery mildew right now. And anything they should do about that? Um, I would just uh, remove the infected leaves and, and dispose of them and otherwise hope that, um, yeah, hope the plant does well. All right. We have a uh, Cumming County viewer that has sort of some orange, rusty looking things on something. What should they do about it? Um, again, I would recommend pruning them out. It's probably a, just another, another one of those rust fung fungi. And if you really want to, you can, um, you can apply some fungicides for that too. All right. Uh, should blighted tomato leaves go into the compost pile? Um, it, yes, they can. Okay. We have people who are saying the red buds look rust, rusty. Is there a fungus that you're familiar with that attacks red buds? Uh, I think there is a rust that affects red buds, yes. Okay, so if we have um, apple scab or cedar apple rust susceptible trees here, are they as susceptible necessarily in the central part of the state? Pow. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, nice job. And um, I made a mistake, actually. Um, blighted, uh, blighted tomato leaves should not be composted. Uh, that, fun that fungus can survive for a couple of years, and so it re would re be recommended to actually burn those composted. Perfect. Burn those leaves. That's your one so. mistake ever. Okay. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Do I get mistakes? No. Oh, You've shoot. been on the show too long. All right. All right are you ready, Bill? <laughs> yes. Do it. So, uh, can this viewer spray now for crabgrass using Trimec? plus a weed killer, and this is in a cemetery. Uh, Trimac is not gonna kill crabgrass. You could spray it now. Um, it's actually big enough where you could get pretty good control out of a lot of them, but you needed something with like drive in it, not just Trimac. Okay, will tenacity take out nimble will, and if so, is this the time to spray for that? Yes and yes. Okay, we have a Battle Creek viewer who wants to know whether they can sedge hammer their sedge now. It's pretty late, you're gonna get pretty bad control, but you could, but it's probably not gonna work. Okay, how late into the fall can this viewer from Ogallala seed bluegrass slash fescue? You know, you can probably seed bluegrass until uh, early to mid-September. Fescue, maybe uh, mid-September, even late September. It all depends on the year, and Ogallala could be all over the board. Okay, so we're coming on Labor Day. Is that when we put on some fertilizer? Yes, fertilize now. Um, it's cool. The, if the grass looks yellow, fertilize it. If it doesn't look yellow, then don't fertilize it. But uh, if it looks yellow, you can benefit from some fertilizer. All right. And how often do you water new sod on construction soils? Great, great question. Um, water it until you can't pull it up anymore. I'm having way too many people that are way, watering their sod for way too long. And I know it's done, but this is a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> You only have to water your sod heavy like a couple times for a couple, for a couple weeks, not for three months. So dial it back when you can't pull that sod up anymore. Apparently this was a, hit a, a real thunderstorm. It, yeah. hit, it hit a nerve. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just see it too sod. often. <laughs> All right, Wayne, you ready? I'm not sure I can follow that passion. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's just, <laughs> <laughs> this is on fire tonight. <laughs> is there a window right now to spray for you want them a scale or is it too late? If you're going to do it, I would use something with acephate and it's going to be systemic and get those scales up underneath the scale rather than try to penetrate the scale. All right. How to treat scale on a 50-year-old crick? Christmas cactus, so an inside plant. Inside plant? Mm -hmm. Well, if you have the time, you can pick them off. Uh, that'd be the easy way to do it. Okay. I know you're going to damage it as much. Otherwise, it's systemic because you don't have to worry about um, anything pollinating it and getting that s systemic. Okay. Uh, we have a Waverly viewer who has tiny little yellow bugs on their milkweed. What are those? Oh, yes. Aphids. It's an exotic aphid. Mm -hmm. um, insecticidal soap, as long as there aren't any monarchs present on okay. caterpillars. Teensy weensy little bright yellow spider. What are those? Do you could think? be a crab spider. Mm -hmm. Okay. Horse chestnuts in Fremont. The leaves are completely lace. Is that rust or is that the dreaded 
JB. I don't know if I dare say Japanese beetle for this because we might get more. <laughs> yeah, don't know yet. Yeah. But and if it's if it's completely uh, laced out where all the veins are left, yeah. uh, I would say it's probably going to be Japanese beetle. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Plant of the week. Yeah. So we have um we have a nice combination here with a grass, an ornamental grass, and then a flowering perennial. So the taller one, this grass, is uh, a cultivar of uh, called Blonde Ambition and uh, Grama. And uh, it's got these fun little kind of eyebrow sort of seed heads on it here. Um, it makes a really pretty little plant in the landscape, about 24 to 28 inches tall, something like that. It does really well in full sun and, and to about partial shade. Uh, and it will do fairly well in dry sites up to moisture, air, moisture areas as well. So um, pretty adaptable. We, we sometimes see a little bit of trouble with winter dieback on this particular cultivar, so um, that's just one little thing to watch out for, but it's a really great uh, ornamental grass uh, to add to a landscape. Then the flower that we have here is um, turtle head, is the common name for this. You, you, if you stretch your imagination, you can kind of imagine these little flowers, each resembling the head of a turtle. <laughs> <laughs> and um, this is a cultivar called Hot Lips which has really large uh, flower, individual flower heads, which I think is really attractive. So they, um, they do really well in uh, partial shade. So if you have a shadier part of a garden, and, and they also do very well in moisture soil. So if you have an area like maybe at the base of a downspout or where you have a low spot, or if you have a rain garden in your um, landscape, turtle head would be a great one to add in those areas. So partial shade to, um, to close to full sun, uh, they'll get a little bit of leaf scorch if they're, in, if they're too dry in way too much uh, hot afternoon sun. But otherwise, they're a great cultivar uh, to put in the landscape. So um, hot lips, turtle head. Thank you, Sarah. And those are in our backyard farmer garden, both of them. So you leave them there and enjoy them. Do not pick them, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Picture four is yours, Wayne. Um, this, is, this is actually a very loyal viewer. She sends us a lot of questions, as many of you do. And this is on the back side of her dogwoods. And she wonders what these little critters are and are they the ones responsible for munching away? Quite likely, these are soft wild larvae. Mm -hmm. And if I wouldn't expect to see that many in one place. So I'm assuming she aggregated some that she found here and there. Um, at this point, uh, you can spray something on there. If you're, you're actually out there going and find them anyway and the plant's not too big, a uh, bucket of warm soapy water where you knock them into there. And soapy water breaks uh, the warm water. It's less dense. They sink better. And then also with that soap, it breaks the surface tension. You send them to their Precision deaths. killing you Your watery there. grave. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's an educational opportunity <laughs> about science. You have it dialed in how to kill that bug. <laughs> I think you should flick them. They look yeah. really flickable. <laughs> Depends on your mood. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bill, um, this is a viewer. Let's see, I'm not sure we know where he's from, but he's calling these grass pods around his flower bed. And I think our viewer can, viewers can see those things that look like little mounds of a different texture and color. He, he wonders what he can do about this. They keep returning. Yeah, that's, that's a tough one from that picture. Um, identifying grasses in general is really hard, um, even though you wouldn't think it may be. Um, we thought it could be, you know, something like a crabgrass or a rough bluegrass, or it could have been uh, grasses from your landscape bed, maybe moving their way in. Like, where are some of the good grasses that move? I got this Miss Campus. Miss Campus is a pen, uh, yeah. Yeah, so. so it's a fountain grass. Fountain grass, yeah. yeah. So those are some of the ones that also could be causing that clumpiness. And um, so you really have to kind of figure out what it is before I give a really good recommendation on how to kill it. Uh, that's really an important part of the whole IPM thing is identifying the pest, right? So a uh, better picture, send a sample to maybe your uh, extension educator and they can get a better ID and, and devise a, a plan of attack for you. All right, thank you, Bill. All right, uh, yours is uh, also Woodbury County, Kyle, and this is Honeysuckle, and it looks like it's probably one of the, the good uh, Major Wheeler or Alabama Scarlet. And all of a sudden, they seem to be developing these problems, and they want to know what to do about it. Can't scrape the spots off. Okay. So that's why you get it instead of Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> 
say. Yeah, I wish we, that we could kind of flick the, flick the fungi off, but that doesn't happen. <laughs> um, could be a couple of things. Um, it could be downy mildew. Um, there's also just a, just a leaf, uh, honeysuckle leaf blight that occurs. And that honeysuckle leaf blight can start off with some, some kind of yellow, yellow chlorotic spots um, that, that turn brown into chlorotic. And also, later in the summer, or around this time, with that honeysuckle blight, you will start to see on the underside of the leaf some of that powdery growth as well. But downy mildew does a similar thing. Um, nice thing is, control for both of those is pretty much the exact same. I would just recommend pruning out the diseased tissue. However, if you are really concerned about it, you, um, you could do a fungicide application, but pruning and then uh, just avoiding overhead watering to stop that spores, those spores from splashing up also helps. Awesome, thank you. And I really like the long view through the lens. Everything looks perfect from a distance. It does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sarah, this is not so perfect. Um, this is a viewer at, at Lake Maloney in North Platte. Planted this tree 13 years ago, doing really well put in a new sh uh, shore well, and the wall is actually six feet further away from the tree. Uh, so, so they haven't really been messing with the tree with it. It's kind of an alkaline, sandy soil. He did use some 2,4-D on the turf, but, and the crack, he says, is not construction damage. He's really most worried, I think, about those yellowing leaves on the linden. Yeah. So. When you have yellowing leaves like that in the canopy of a tree, it, it usually indicates that the tree is not being able to pick up enough water to keep all of that foliage alive. So the tree allows some of those leaves to just senesce and die and fall. So why is this tree not able to pick up enough water to uh, keep all that foliage alive? Well, it could have been root damage from the reconstruction of the wall. Um, that, that crack on the trunk could also be related to root damage. We quite often see uh, if there's root damage, then some death of bark above those roots that then cracks, uh, it, as you see in that picture. Um, you know, people will look at that tree and they'd say, you know, that wall is six feet away. That's, that's way far out of the root zone. Well, that's really not true. That tree has lots of roots, the, wa the small water absorbing roots over in that area. So there probably was a significant amount of root damage that happened when they did the reconstruction of the wall. So then you also want to look at, okay, what's your watering been this year? We've had fairly good periodic rains this summer, but we have had some um, uh, periods of dry as well with some pretty high temperatures. So it could be that the tree is getting too dry during some of those periods and maybe some good deep watering would help to minimize this. So, you know, look at those kinds of things. It doesn't look like the tree is gonna die. It just looks like it's a little bit stressed. And maybe if they um, address the watering, I would also put some mulch around the base of that tree instead of letting the grass grow right up to the trunk. That's another good basic practice. Try to improve the vigor of this tree and I think maybe you'll be able to um, eliminate that problem in years to come. All right, thank you, Sarah. Well, no garden would be complete without a few bean plants. There are plenty of great varieties and types for you to try. Here to tell us more is Terry James. Tomatoes are the most popular plant grown in the homeowner's vegetable garden, but green beans are number two. There are lots of different green beans to try in your homeowner's garden. We have shell beans, we have snap beans, and we have dry beans. Those three beans are gonna be great in all homeowner's gardens. Snap beans or, or string beans are usually the most common. Those are planted um, as soon as the ground gets warm, they're planted about every two weeks and harvested throughout the summer. They are harvested when they are still immature, so those, the bean seeds are much smaller. The shells are immature and soft, and you are able to either eat those raw, steamed, or even pickled. The shelling beans are ones that are um, left to grow a little bit longer in your garden. The, the shells then become dry and hard, but, and the seed becomes mature, but it's still soft and supple. You'll actually harvest them and take the bean out of the shell. You can put them in soups, or you can use them as a side dish. The final one that you can grow in your home garden are dry beans. Dry beans are grown all season long. They are let to grow till the, both the bean and the shell are dry. They're harvested. They can stay on your pantry shelf indefinitely almost 
and they're one of the higher protein and fiber beans that there are. As you grow beans, there are three different kinds of beans that you can grow. There are pole beans, there are bush beans, and then there are half runners. Bush beans are usually the most common. They don't need any support. They get to be about two foot tall. They're usually the snap beans. Harvest basically all at once, so if you're looking at doing any kind of um, canning or anything, those are usually ones that you want to look at. And once you harvest them, you will get a little bit of harvest after that if you continually pick the beans when they're ready. The pole beans are ones that will grow five to six foot tall. They'll continually make beans all season long. You'll just get small amounts though. So those will be ones that you're gonna kind of continually have fresh beans throughout the season. Half runners are kind of that in between. They're gonna grow to about three foot tall. You can support them if you need to. However, it's not necessarily needed. And they um, are more sometimes the dry beans are what half runners are. When you plant beans, you need to plant them about an inch deep or make sure that you read the back of the container. If they are a little bit smaller, you need to make them a little more shallow. They do um, like uh, warm weather, so you need to make sure that you're planting them after the last frost. And they would do really well for fall gardens. So since we're the first of August right now, you can actually plant them and get a nice fall harvest of beans this year. You also need to make sure that beans stay very well moist. They don't like super wet and they don't like super dry, but more on the dry side. So water them about once a week so that they're about, you get about an inch of moisture down into the soil. Make sure that you're mulching them so the soil does stay moist throughout that whole week and that you are not getting any weeds in there to help keep the weed suppression down. You have three different choices of beans, lots of different varieties. So go try all the different varieties next year in your home garden. Beans really are fairly easy to grow. Now you know different types that you could try for next season.